has never been and there will never be a God like you a love so true there has never been and there will never be a God like you a love so
Listen to the words of 1 Peter chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Let's sing together about this living hope.
a seat. I am uh, always so excited to come in here on Wednesday night uh, here at our midweek service because what is happening in this room right now represents the most important things in the universe forever. So if you think about life has this uh, tractor beam to it, the world has this appeal and this pull where it just pulls you in and it's easy to think about, hey, what's really important is um, my job or the news or uh, the debates that we're having with our children or uh, our spouses. And life just can get all consuming and all engrossing and we can do that in a way that shoves God to the side. And we come in here uh, on a Wednesday night in the middle of the week in between Sundays with people that we love so much, people that we are serving with. We get to sing songs about Jesus Christ. We get to pray to Jesus Christ. We get to hear the word of Jesus preached to us and it has a reorienting function. It allows us the opportunity to refocus and remind us that the reason we're all here is Jesus. And every meeting that I have had today, uh, every conversation I have had today, uh, Every relationship that you've built into today only matters in a billion years if it is done with respect to Jesus. And so what an opportunity and a privilege it is for us to be here. Uh, I'm excited that Pastor Sean in just a few moments is going to preach the word of Jesus to us about how we can grow into the image of Jesus. Uh, I'm excited about the opportunity we're going to have to respond to that and pray about that and sing about that. And I just want to encourage you that if it's true, and it is true, that the only thing that matters in life is the thing we do for Jesus, uh, then what really is crucial is the people who aren't here, the people who aren't with us, being reminded of who Jesus is, being built up in who he is and what he's done for us, hearing about him for the first time. And so I want to encourage you um, and I'll make a commitment to you, but you make a commitment to me. What if this week we thought about reach, we thought about Jesus, we thought about how brief this little life is, and we made a commitment that between now and Sunday we'll pray and tell someone about Jesus. We'll pray and invite someone to church here, a coworker, a friend, a neighbor, a sibling, a spouse. I'll make that commitment to you. Would you make that commitment to me this week between now and Sunday? You want to do it? Okay. Well, then let's pray. Father, the only thing that matters in life is Jesus. Everything else is just window dressing. What a tragedy it is to close the drapes and think the fabric of the curtains is all that matters. Help us to push the curtains out of the way and see the panoramic view of Jesus Christ. I pray that we would fall in love with him, that we would be overwhelmed with his goodness to us and overwhelmed with his goodness to us, we, out of the overflow of that, would share him with others. I want to pray that you would give me and these men and women an opportunity to point to Jesus in our lives this week. Even if you're a pastor like me, you can get distracted with the busyness of the work and lose that the goal of the work has a name, Jesus. Help us to love him. Help us to share him. I pray that as we continue in singing, I pray that as Pastor Sean preaches, that you'd stir our hearts for Jesus Christ, change the world because of what happens in this room tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
Good evening. It is good to see you guys again on this summer night. We are in the middle of a series on the topic of discipleship. And we have a lot to discuss tonight. And I invite you to turn to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 3. And we will be looking at the topic tonight on how Jesus made disciples. Mark 3, we'll start in verse 7. And while you're turning there, we, uh, I have a goal tonight, and it is to look at the Gospels perhaps a different way than you typically have looked at them. I want to change how we think about Jesus' ministry here on earth. And uh, I am praying that it is life-altering. So let me read the text, and then we will pray and ask the Lord for his help. Mark 3, starting in verse 7, Jesus withdrew to the sea with his disciples, and a great multitude from Galilee followed, and also from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Edomay, and beyond the Jordan, and the vicinity of Tyre and Sidon, And a great number of people heard of all that he was doing and came to him. And he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd, so that they would not crowd him. For he had healed many, with the result that all of those who had afflictions pressed around him in order to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, They would fall down before him and shout, You are the Son of God. And he earnestly warned them not to tell who he was. And then he went up on the mountain 
and he summoned those to whom he himself wanted, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve so that they would be with him, and that he could send them out to preach and to have authority to cast out the demons. And he appointed the twelve, Simon Peter, whom he gave the name, Simon, whom he gave the name Peter, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name, and I do not know how to pronounce that there, so uh, I'm not as skilled as Heath when he read the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, so you'll uh, just have to look over that there. But it means the son of thunder, whatever Bonagoras means. So, and Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the sons of Alphaeus, and Theodias, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And he came home, and a crowd gathered again to such an extent that he could not even eat a meal. Let's pray. Father, we want to look at the ministry of your son, Jesus Christ, and we want to be different tonight because of it. God, I ask as we look at your word and examine how you made disciples, that we would be transformed. As we behold you and your example, that we would be different. That we would be used by you to turn the world upside down and that lives would be different because of this night together. God, we cannot do this on our own. I cannot preach on my own. I cannot teach on my own. And so I ask for your help, and I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been talking about discipleship. And we've been talking about how discipleship is not a firework display. It's not something that you happen at the beginning of your Christian life, and it's a bing and a bang and a boom, and then it's gone. Rather, discipleship is like a city on a hill that lights up every night, and it's consistent, and it's steady. We're not looking for mere one-time decisions to follow Jesus. We want people who make decisions every single day to follow after Jesus. We talked about discipleship as a definition, and that definition is discipleship is helping others look more like Jesus. Helping each other look more like Christ. Last week, we talked about what it would require to make disciples. This week, I want to talk about the secret recipe for making disciples. It's the, uh, the secret sauce that is hard to know if it actually exists when you go to a restaurant and they tell you there's a secret recipe, you are skeptical, you don't believe it. But it's there, it's really there. There's a secret to making disciples and it's the best kept secret ever and it is a secret that's actually really, really obvious if you can see it. If, uh, if you've ever lost anything Maybe you lost the keys to your car and you're looking and all of a sudden you realize after much prayer and angst and maybe a little bit of sinful frustration with your spouse that they were in your pocket the whole time. Or uh, maybe you're looking for your glasses and they're on your head. Or worse, you're wearing them. It has happened. It's obvious, but you can't, you can't see it until someone points it out. And what I want to do tonight is I want to point out an obvious secret that Jesus has on display for us. So the question I'm asking is, what is the best way to make disciples? This is important because as what Pastor Heath was saying, the most important thing we can do is the Great Commission. There's nothing else that's more significant than that. If it's true that making disciples is the most important thing we can do, 
we should be asking, how? How do we do it? What's the best way? Everyone in this room will breathe a last breath at some point. That's the reality is that everyone here, we will die and go into eternity. And then all of the days we had on earth will be done. It'll be over, gone. And if this is the most important thing we can be doing, we should see and ask, how can we maximize our time? How can we make the most disciples? One life to live will soon will be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. If we believe that, we should ask, how can we get the biggest bang for our buck? How can we squeeze into this small little life the most amount of disciples that we can make? How can we do it? Well, the answer will shock you. The answer is in our text that we read tonight. Jesus decided that he would change the world by personally investing into a small number of people. That's shocking. The primary way that Jesus changed the world was by personally discipling, personally investing a few people. Jesus lived approximately 33 years on earth Only three of those years were devoted to his public ministry. And Jesus, in the text that we read, he had crowds and crowds of people. So many people that in Mark 3 verse 9, he told his disciples that a boat should stand ready for him because of the crowd. Because they they were pushing on him. They were crowding him out. He had healed so many people that word had spread and he had a massive following. But the crowds were not the primary way that Jesus spent his ministry. If you read in uh, the book of Luke, Luke 10, you'll hear about the 72 that were sent out by Jesus. So you have these crowds that followed him, and then there's a little bit of a narrower number that's 72. And those people are sent out to preach about the kingdom of God. But here in Mark 3, he narrows that group even a little further down. He narrows it down to 12. He picks 12 disciples that he is going to invest personally in. Actually, within that 12, if you read the Gospels carefully, you'll find there was, there's an even smaller ring of three. There's even a closer ring of Peter, James, and John. And uh, if you read in Luke 8, uh, you'll know that when uh, Jesus heals uh, the daughter of the synagogue leader, he only allowed Peter, James, and John to go in. Interesting. And then you get to the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is going to be transfigured into his glorious appearance. And only three people are taken up on the mountain. Peter, James, and John. And then when Jesus gets to the final hours of his life in the Garden of Gethsemane, he brings three people with him. Peter, James, and John. So Jesus, if we, if you take, uh, Pastor Heath has said this before, if you take a highlighter and you go through Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, and you highlight in red every time Jesus is preaching a sermon, and then you highlight in yellow every time Jesus has an individual conversation or a conversation with his disciples, you will have a lot more yellow than you will red. 
Jesus spent the bulk of his ministry in personal conversations with a few people. Think about this. He could have spent all of his time preaching. Would, that would make a little more sense, wouldn't it? You get more of a bang for your buck if you have a crowd. So to preach to the crowd. Don't waste your time on a few fishermen. But that's not what Jesus did. Jesus, in his three years of ministry, he, he did go on a speaking tour. But that's not where all the action was. Jesus didn't spend all of his time writing a book. He never wrote a book. His disciples wrote a book. Jesus didn't spend a time crafting a program or a curriculum. Instead, he went to individual people, and in Mark chapter 3, it says he selected them. He chose them. He called them. And he picked them to be with him. This is not the method that is going to win the Church Growth Movement Award. Uh, There's not a church guru who on their own would say, you know what, I I think the way we can grow our church is by just pouring into a few people. That's backwards. That doesn't make sense to our minds. There's a book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. Billy Graham wrote the Ford for it. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And in it, Robert Coleman says this, Jesus' concern was not with programs to reach the multitudes, but with men whom the multitudes would follow. Remarkable as it may seem, Jesus started to gather these men before he ever organized an evangelistic campaign and before he ever preached a sermon in public. Men were his method of winning the world to God. People, investing personally in people was the way Jesus turned the world upside down. It wasn't a program, it was people. How did the gospel get to us in this room in America today? I want to be clear. The primary way Jesus changed the world was through his life, death, and resurrection and reconciling the world unto himself because he's the son of God. But that message got to us here today because Jesus invested in 12 people. He invested in those people who went and invested in other people and preached the gospel and carried it. This model, this example is so obvious, but we miss it. We don't think this way. But this is how the Apostle Paul thought. In the book of Acts, it says that he went and called the elders of his church as he went to Ephesus. And when when Paul had come to them, he said, you yourselves know from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and trials that come upon me from the plots of the Jews, and how I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable, teaching you publicly and from house to house. That's fascinating. Paul preached publicly and then went from house to house to meet with individuals and disciple people. He took people with him everywhere he went. Timothy. Timothy was a disciple of Paul. Silas, a missionary disciple that Paul poured into. And one of my very favorite passages is in the book of Acts. And in Acts 17, uh, Paul and Silas have shown up 
to uh, this city and the people are so disturbed by what Paul has been preaching that they go and they look for Paul and Silas. They can't find him. And so they go and they go to the house of a guy named Jason. It says that Jason had housed them. So this was the house to house thing. Paul was taking this method and Jason had become a disciple and they dragged Jason and others into the street and they said, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too, declaring another king besides Caesar, King Jesus. These who have turned the world upside down and they're dragging Jason who was housing Paul and Silas whom they had discipled. And I think this is the same method that Jesus used. Investing intentionally in a public ministry, but most significantly and primarily in individual people whom he's discipling. So, if you remember last week, we talked about discipleship required four things. It required the scriptures. So it's it's a conversation about pointing people to Jesus. It required a relationship It's not just dispensing truth. It's a relationship that you invest in. It requires effort and it requires planning. And I want to argue that Jesus did all four of those in his method of discipleship. So the first one's the most obvious. Discipleship requires scripture. And Jesus is the word. He centered his whole ministry upon himself. He is the word of God incarnate. So when he spoke, he was teaching his disciples. So that's, that's the most obvious one. Jesus centered the conversations around himself. The second one, discipleship requires relationship. Jesus is our example in this. And the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus was able to say that to his disciples, and it means something because he was with them in his ministry. He was able to encourage them and say, I'm going to be with you always because he modeled being with them in his earthly ministry. He had an authentic relationship with his disciples. This is massively important. When when you buy something and you hear that it's off of an assembly line, that's, nah, that's not very exciting. An assembly line just means it was cranked out. Just, you got a product just like everyone else. It's typical. It's general. Everyone has it. But when you hear that this was handmade, this was handcrafted, this was personally tailored to you. Now that is a product that people want. That is exciting. That's more expensive. I was walking recently. uh, Jenny and Chandler and I were on a stroll in a shopping center and we walked by a suit shop and there's this big giant sign on the side of the window and it says, every man deserves a hand tailored suit starting at $350. And I thought about that, and what they're doing in that advertisement is they're trying to appeal to the hand-tailored suit. You don't want just a generic suit. You can get one of those for a hundred bucks at wherever. But you come to our store, and we personalize it for you. It's not off an assembly line. It's not just suits. It's donuts, okay? So donuts... You go to Walmart, and you, you can get a box of donuts that have been like under a light bulb at some point, and you can buy them. We have them floating around here every Sunday morning. But you can go to Good, Good, Good Dough or the donut shop, and you can get 
a handcrafted, organic, artesian donut. And they're more expensive. And they're good. They're good. The good dough donuts, the artisan donuts there, they're great. Love them. They're awesome. And they know it. And they're making money. And they're getting your money. In discipleship, Jesus doesn't want us to have an assembly line mentality. He wants us to have a hand-tailored personal relationship that we're investing in. And he modeled that for us. He modeled it. He wants us to write handwritten notes, not typed up notes that we just mass mail. When, when you think about discipleship, do you think in terms of assembly line? Oh, I sent my kids to camp and they will get discipled at camp. That's the program where they go to get discipled. Wrong. Now they do get discipled, but that's not the end of it. Jesus wants personal investment in your children from you to make disciples. The burden is on you. Do you think of discipleship as, oh, if I just get this person to the passion play, then they will grow in their faith and godliness and look more like Jesus. Maybe that's a part of it, but that is not discipleship. View discipleship as an investment in people, a hands-on personal relationship, not a program that is great and good, but only part of the discipleship pie, only a slice. When we think about this, Jesus modeled this perfectly. Jesus not only did relationships, he put effort into his relationships. Think about the effort here that's required. In, in this same text in Mark 3, the, the uh, parallel text in Luke 6, it says Jesus, before he selected the 12, went up on the mountainside and prayed all night long and then chose his disciples. That's effort. He, he took this seriously. He spent the whole night in prayer about who he was going to pick to be his disciples. And then when you're in the discipleship relationship, it requires effort because there are all kinds of ridiculous things the disciples say. You know it. If you read the gospels, you, you just think, Peter, what is wrong with you, man? Why did you ask that question? And Jesus takes effort to caringly and lovingly talk with Peter about the ridiculous things he says. He doesn't just kick him to the curb and say, okay, Peter, man, you're done. I'm sorry I ever selected you. Think about it. Jesus, he's talking with Peter, and Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yes, Peter, Spirit has revealed this to you. That was not revealed to you by flesh, but by the Holy Spirit. And then seven verses later, Peter says, you can't go to the cross, Jesus. You, you can't go to the cross. And Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. Seven verses later, he just said that, Peter, you're doing great. Good work. The Holy Spirit revealed something to you. Praise God. And then now, get behind me, Satan. But he had a relationship with him where he could invest in him and carry on a conversation with him and direct him and disciple him and help him. Not only did it take effort, it takes planning. We talked about that last week and Jesus modeled that. Jesus, so look in, look in Mark 3 and look at verse 13. And he went up to the mountain and summoned those whom he himself wanted and they came to him. And he appointed the twelve that they would be with him. That's the relationship part. They would be with him. 
And that's just fascinating. It's the first thing it mentions, that they would be with him and that he could send them out to preach. So he said, come with me for the purpose of being able to send them out. And then he, in verse 16, he appoints the 12. It's strategic. It's not haphazard. It's intentional planning. He identified them, prayed about them, selected them, and had a plan for them. What does a good plan look like for when you're discipling someone? How do you do it? Let me give you two categories. Formal versus informal. Formal discipleship versus informal discipleship moments. Jesus models both of these in the gospel. So, Jesus had formal moments of discipleship that he strategically planned. This is, well, it's the sermon series right now on the Beatitudes. When he saw the crowds, Matthew 5, 1, he went upon the mountainside and sat down and he began to teach them saying. That was a formal, intentional discipleship moment. He gathers the the crowds, the disciples were included, and he says, I'm going to teach to you. Jesus does this with his 12 at uh, the Last Supper. He has an intentional teaching time in John 13 where he explains about what's about to happen to him. It's a formal time where he instructs them and he hears their feedback from him on what he taught. There are times, and there should be times, with the people you're investing in, that you have formal moments of discipleship that has an agenda, a beginning and an end, a start time, an end time. Let me give you an example. A formal kind of discipleship moment is when you say, hey, you know what? I would love to read the book of 1 John with you every other Monday for coffee before work. And let's get together. It'll be a time where I want to hear what you're thinking as you read the Bible. And I want to tell you what I'm thinking when I read the Bible. And I want to pray together. And then you do that for six weeks. That is a formal time of discipleship. And that is a personal investment that is structured and good. And that is part of what Jesus wants us to do. Or it could be a formal moment of you say, hey, you know what? I... uh, I would love to have you and your wife over for dinner and we would just love to pray together and pray for you and hear about what the Lord's doing in your life. And they come over for six o'clock for dinner and they gather and you spend two hours together and you hear what God's doing in their life and you pray for them and they ask you questions and you give them answers and you have a formal discipleship moment. Jesus had those. And Jesus had informal moments of discipleship. Think about all the times that Jesus did this. Jesus, in John chapter 4, is with the woman at the well. And the disciples went off to go get food. And they come back, and they have seen that Jesus was talking to the Samaritan woman. And she leaves, and they go, Wow, Jesus, what were you doing? And, And aren't you hungry? And Jesus says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. And they're like, whoa, what's he doing? Did did, did you give him food, Peter? What happened? Jesus took a moment that everyone has to deal with, which is hunger and food. And he made an informal discipleship moment out of it. And he said, I have food to eat of which you don't know about. Jesus is walking with his disciples And they pass a fig tree. And Peter says, Jesus, that fig tree, it withered just like you said it would the other day. And Jesus takes the moment to instruct him that if you have faith, you can move mountains. And if you have faith, a fig tree will wither. He took an informal moment when they're walking on the road and he turned it into a discipleship moment. On the road to Emmaus, He's talking with two disciples and he spends the whole journey talking to them about how the Old Testament points to him. They're walking along the path, talking informally about things, and then he turns the conversation 
towards himself. In your relationships, plan and look for formal and informal moments to disciple others. Formal and informal mom- moments matter, but they take scripture, relationship, effort, and planning. And Jesus modeled all of those for us. Jesus decided that he would change the world by using a handful of people. Think about the math. I went to Bible college to avoid math. I do not like it. I am not good at it. But I did some math in preparation for this sermon. If you, if you discipled two people a year, two, not 12, two, and you invested in them for a year, and then at the end of that year, you taught them to do the same. That would be in two years, six people being discipled. You do that for five years, and in five years' time, with you discipling two people a year, and they go in discipling two people a year, you have 48 people that are disciples. Now, if 25 of you did that, 25, just 25 people took what I just said and did it, do you know how many people would have been discipled in five years? Over a thousand. And they would be in this church because they would have relationships with you. They wouldn't be gone. They would be here because it's an authentic life-on-life relationship that explodes. The math explodes. If only 25 people, we would add 1,000 people in five years. That's amazing. And that's the math that changed the world. That's the math that actually has us here. And Jesus did it with 12. And we can do it with just two or maybe even just one starting out. And Jesus wants us to do that, to obey the Great Commission. And so I want to ask you tonight, have you prayed for someone that you can disciple? Have you prayed about it? Have you seriously thought, who is that one or two people that I can pour into? And I want to ask that we do that tonight as our part of our response time. And if you're here tonight and you are not a Christian and you have heard me talk about discipleship, I want to tell you the reason why we are here is because we want you to know Jesus personally, his life, death, and resurrection, and the forgiveness of sins. And if you're here and you're like, I want to be a part, I want to be a disciple of Jesus, come talk to us. We would love to talk to you and pray with you and uh, speak with you about that. So let's stand and let's pray. And we'll sing a closing song and ask God to put people on our hearts to disciple. Heavenly Father, I pray right now that you would put on our hearts people we know, that we can reach out to and say, hey, let's get together. Let's spend time together talking about the Bible and that we would have formal and informal moments of discipleship. I pray that you would give us specific people an opportunity to speak to them even this week about that. Father, I pray if there's anyone here who they don't know what it means to be a disciple, that their heart would be pricked and that they would reach out tonight in faith, to receive your forgiveness. 
We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. before me the world behind me the cross before